For thousands of years, salmon have been harvested from the ocean, bays, and rivers of the Pacific Northwest. The salmon is a link between the region's cultures and is central to the way of life here in the Northwest. Salmon were plentiful throughout Washington for thousands of years. And while many stocks today remain healthy, some are depleted. This has occurred despite dramatic reductions in harvest by both Indian and non-Indian fishermen and the ongoing efforts of many organizations to strengthen these weak runs. Some suggest the solution is simple. Stop fishing and the wild runs will come back. But that is just not the case. Initially, you would see an increase in the number of returning fish, but then you would quickly see a decline again. This is because it is not the harvest or the harvest methods that we use that are mainly responsible for depleting salmon runs. Population growth, loss of habitat, pollution, climate changes. These are some of the major elements that are causing the decline of salmon runs. The goal for every fisheries manager and fisherman is to ensure enough salmon return to spawn in the rivers of Washington State every year in order to protect the species for future generations. To understand the complexities of accomplishing this goal, you first have to understand the migratory patterns of salmon and the conservation efforts that are already in place. Salmon from Washington migrate out of rivers and into the open ocean. Most then swim into Canadian and Alaskan waters in the North Pacific for two to six years until they return to the very spot they were born to spawn and perpetuate the life cycle. Returning adult salmon are harvested all along their migration route. Some salmon from Washington, for example, are harvested in Alaska and Canada. Tribal and state fisheries managers must take into consideration the harvest of Washington salmon in those areas when planning the harvest of fish in our state. The number of returning salmon from each river system is traced at various stages of the migration to determine which stocks are strong and which are weak. With this information, tribal and state fisheries managers can make sure that weak stocks are not over-harvested and that enough salmon return to their birthplace to spawn. When adult salmon begin migrating home after years at sea, both weak and strong stocks from numerous rivers become intermingled in what are known as mixed stock areas. Limited fisheries in these areas, such as along the north coast of Washington and the Strait of Juan de Fuca, are carefully controlled by time and location to a level that protects the weakest stocks. By the time salmon returning to the Puget Sound region have worked their way home, Fisheries in Alaska and Canada, as well as non-Indian commercial and sport fisheries in Washington, and a small number of tribal fisheries have already caught a percentage of the run. However, not many of the general public sees these harvests taking place. Tribal fishermen, on the other hand, often are literally at the end of the line when it comes to harvest and generally are extremely visible because of where they fish. The treaties with the United States government govern these locations. When the tribes gave up most of the land that is now western Washington, they kept what was most important to them. Among those reserved rights is the right to fish for salmon in all of their traditional fishing places. Many of these fishing places are in terminal areas at the mouths of rivers and in bays. Tribal terminal area fisheries are selective in nature. By the time salmon reach these areas, weak and strong stocks are no longer mixed allowing tribal fishermen to target only healthy runs that can support harvest. Because tribal fishermen often are highly visible from cities and major roadways, and because often this is the only harvest that many people see, some assume that tribal fishermen are taking more than their fair share of the resource. This is not true. They are taking only their allotted share of the harvestable catch. Like all fishermen, their harvests are closely monitored to ensure the resource is not over-harvested. Tribal enforcement officers enforce these harvest regulations, and violations can result in fines or even loss of fishing privileges. Every time a tribal fisherman sells his catch, his identification number, the number and species of fish sold, and total weight are recorded by the buyer. This information is shared on a same-day basis with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, which shares information on non-Indian harvest with the tribes as part of the ongoing co-management efforts 
to guarantee full compliance by all fishermen and to improve management of the resource. People who don't understand how nets work often think tribal fishing nets are stretched all the way across a river, catching every fish that swims upstream. Often, what people see is an anchor line holding the net in place. The net itself usually extends only about one-third of the way across the stream. Floats keep the net suspended in the water, but the net does not extend all the way to the bottom. This allows many fish to swim under or around the net and continue upstream. The mesh size is regulated to make the nets even more selective. This allows smaller fish to swim through the net and prevents larger fish from becoming entangled. For example, if tribal fishermen were targeting coho salmon, a trout, which tends to be much smaller than a coho, would be able to swim right through the net. A Chinook salmon, which tends to be much larger than a coho, would bump into the net and then swim around or under it. Nets are not just set and then left. They are set for a short time and checked often. Like all other fishermen, tribal fishermen can only fish a certain number of hours a day and days per week to prevent overfishing. These narrow windows of fishing time allow tribal fishermen to be even more selective in their harvest of targeted fish. Another type of selective fishing technique long used by tribal fishermen is beach seining. This method allows the fishermen to sort the live catch by hand and return any non-targeted fish back to the water. Selective fisheries are just one of the tools used by the tribes to responsibly manage the resource. For the last 20 years, the tribes and the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife have also dramatically reduced harvests in response to dwindling salmon runs. Many fisheries have been eliminated. Others have been reduced up to 90%. This has resulted in economic hardships for many. But these drastic harvest reductions have not solved the problem of declining salmon populations. This is because the single biggest factor contributing to the decline of the wild salmon populations is not fishing. It is urban sprawl, growth. More people mean more houses, more shopping malls and office buildings, more pavement, more need for water, and more potential for pollution. For the salmon, this means loss of natural habitat and less chance of survival. As we remove more trees, and cover our land with buildings and pavement. We are covering nature's watersheds, and the lands can no longer absorb all of the winter rains. This causes floods that wash away or bury the salmon eggs under mud, resulting in fewer offspring. Because more people require more water, our rivers and aquifers are being drawn down to low levels. Less water means salmon eggs can't incubate. Young salmon may not be able to migrate out to sea and returning adult salmon may not be able to make it back to their spawning grounds. More people also bring the potential of more pollution. Yard fertilizers, pesticides, detergents and oil getting into our groundwater and ending up in our rivers. All of this kills salmon. Our goal is to protect the salmon runs so that they are here for thousands of years to come. We cannot restore the salmon resource to full health if we continue to rely only on reducing harvest to reach our goal. We're going to have to do much more. The Treaty Indian Tribes in Western Washington have teamed up with local, state, and federal agencies, conservation groups, industry, and the public in efforts to protect, restore, and enhance the salmon resource. Every year, the tribes restore miles of stream habitat monitor water quality, and work together in many other ways to protect the salmon and its home. We're trying to recover the salmon and uh, bring them back, and my whole life has been and, and will continue to be uh, bringing people together. Uh, it's important to all of our people. It's important to all of our children, the non-Indian community, as well as everyone else. It's important to them sports fishermen. It's important to the commercial people. It's important to uh, just everyone in the Northwest. It's, it's part of our life. It, it's always been here, and hopefully it'll always remain here.